Welcome, welcome. Uh, this is going to be the recording of our exam three, session two. Okay, um, if you would please go ahead and sign in using the QR code for attendance. And this one's going to be kind of a long one, so um, just buckle down. <clears throat> but I guarantee you this would help with care plans. This will help with uh, also your exam content as well. All right, normal, normal newborn. Um, created by Ali, and uh, I added some things as well. I've also created a student view PowerPoint, so that'll help with those that want to go and fill in the blank or print them out and fill in the blank as well. All right, initial st stabilization of the neonate. Um, warm, dry stimulate. This is kind of, you know, we want to make sure that they're not losing any heat, so we're going to be replacing those wet blankets. If, uh, if they're not breathing after 30 seconds, we're going to start breathing for them. We're going to do a positive pressure ventilation. Um, but it's important that we cannot provide 100% oxygen without a reservoir and a power source. The rate for the vent is going to be one to three if needed. And what the pulse is, <clears throat> We're going to be observing their heart rate. So if it's more than 60, they are, well, it needs to be more than 100. So if it is, um, if the heart rate is less than 60, we're going to start some, some compressions to help them out. If it's in between that 60, 100 range, uh, we're going to continue until um, the, we're going to continue that PPV, okay? Sorry, my dog's behind me. All right, Abgar. We've kind of talked about this already, but um, this is our Abgar. Where this is that really test that's done at one in five minutes. Um, really, this uh, you're definitely going to get a question on this. So I would uh, take some practice questions during this stuff and uh, just kind of try it out, okay? Mm, sorry. Okay, with this... Um, Whenever they're crying and they're kind of moving a lot, that's going to be always kind of, that's going to really easily warrant a good score. Um, it's important to note also that we could have, um, you know, a pink body and then just blue arms and legs. And that actually would be, um, the color would be for one point there. So that's usually what makes them get nine points. So just kind of memorize this. Um, you know, uh, I believe she may have, Kind of explain this with you guys, but uh, this chart here is just kind of a big summary of that. Okay, All right, let's keep moving. All right, so kind of overview. Really, just we want to initiate skin to skin contact. Um, it's always going to help. Um, after that, you know, whenever we like measure them and things like that, we're going to be putting them on a radiant warmer. Um, we want to make sure that they're not getting cold. Okay, because that could be a lot of potential issues and. Um, it kind of goes along with that. Okay, next is going to be the clamping and the cutting of the cord. Um, you know, a lot of times the family can do it as well if they would like. Me personally, I would be, eh, I feel like I might do it, but I'd be scared. I don't know. I'd be like, do you, you, you know where to cut it better? But a lot of times they'll kind of give you a section. The doctor would be like, here, cut this right here. Just cut right in the middle. That's fine. Um, and we're doing that Abgar as well. So you can even kind of observe them to see how they are um, by looking at how with when they're on that skin-to-skin -skin contact, things like that. But yeah. Okay, so the first med here is going to be erythromycin. This is that ointment that's going to be putting on the, uh, I believe it's the intercanthus um, of the eyes for eye prophylaxis. Okay, that's going to be talked about later in this PowerPoint as well, but um, that's kind of what that's for. And then uh, vitamin K, it's also called that A word. Um, make sure you know either or because she could give you both. Um, and this is just, we, <clears throat> we want to be initiating clotting factors. Um, and a lot of teaching is going to be done with this as well because, you know, when it comes to meds, they very well could um, refuse them, but we just don't want to be doing that. Okay. Uh, now I'm going on to the assessment. <clears throat> Really, the assessment is just making sure that um, they're transitioning well, okay? Um, color, temp, tone, activity, their respiratory effort, 
if they have a sign of distress, those would be the things we're looking out for as well. And this rest of this PowerPoint is going to be talking kind of about this um, complete, focal, complete physical assessment. My respiratory, um, really just a fluid to air environment. They're going from a fish to a mammal, um, a big shift in the lungs, okay? Uh, of course, you know, while in utero, there's a lot of pressure um, within those lungs, so no blood is actually going to them. They're kind of bypassing it, okay? Um, and with this, just the, if they were filled with fluid, and it's going to be eventually having all air through that, so that's kind of what it's doing. Um, so it's kind of going into, I believe, talking about the uh, the, breath the breathing movements and kind of what switches that transition, okay? Okay, very important slide here. Um, breathing movements during birth, the fluid is moved out of the lungs as the fetus passes through the birth canal. And that first compression that occurs um, actually does kind of create that negative pressure. Um, then they're, <clears throat> then they're going to passive have that first in inhalation and the air will kind of start coming into the lungs. All right, with that uh, first exhale, uh, it's gonna be shifting to a positive pressure in the lungs and now more, there's more of a movement of air throughout the alveoli. Um, then they get towards the capillaries um, and lymphatic system. Then that downward movement of the diaphragm pulls in the second uh, inhalation. Um, and the air volume in the alveoli is gonna be increasing, leading to increased pulmonary blood flow. Um, therefore, next is gonna be less resistance from the fluids and alveoli. It's gonna be picking up the absorbed fluids more and more. You really wouldn't need to know the process of this, but just, just kind of know the general stuff. Um, I would say that the important thing with this is that when it comes to like things like C-sections, um, you know, they're not getting that compression by going through the birth canal. So they, a lot of times they might need some support, okay? That's kind of what's going on. All right, the, with, in regard to surfactant and alveoli, um, this is kind of already on our old past content, but uh, surfactant is produced between 20 and 32 weeks, but we want them to be mature. So we always want them to be past 32 weeks. Um, if they are not at that level, we're gonna be giving them some steroids to kind of uh, speed up the process right at the end before they come out, okay? Sorry, I, I've had I kind of go this morning. Um, our synthetic surfactant can be given. Um, a lot of times with with your diabetes patients, okay, uh, they're going to be that's that could be like not allowing surfactant from being made. Um, and the kind of the difference between term babies and preemies is uh, the amount of surfactant they have. Okay, so they're if they're really preemie, they might have some troubles breathing. Respiratory stimuli. All right, cord clamping. Uh, cord is clamped. This is going to stop the blood flow from the mom. This is going to increase the pulmonary carbon dioxide, decrease that pH, decrease the pressure of oxygen. I'm sorry, pressure of CO2. <clears throat> uh, think of coming up from underwater. Think of what else could uh, cause asphyxiate in the fetus, cord prolapse, placental abruption, cord compression. If the cord is not clamped, placenta will dribble normally. Um, same process will happen. Make sure the clamp is in place and all the extremities are out of the way. Um, clamp as close to the umbilical cord whenever the pulsation drops, uh, stops, and mom is still having contractions. Um, always kind of allow them to get as much um, oxygen rich blood as possible. And then if they have a, de de a delayed cord clamping, that could kind of lead to jaundice in a way because of the breakdown of the blood. Uh, in regards to temp, um, cold temp stimulates the breathing center. Mom's stomach to room temp is a shock because it is very cold in, <coughs> in those hospital rooms compared to uh, inside the mom's body. All right, next is suctioning. Suctioning is kind of uh, a PRN thing, only if indicated. Uh, this will be done with the bulb syringe. 
um, if they're having fluids kind of in their mouth. All right, gastric suction can be used um, if they have meconium in the stomach, with an EG, EG, EG tube. Um, you're gonna be squeezing before you're putting in. Um, think of the mouth, then nose. Cardio, okay, this is that fun stuff. <coughs> Here's that, vid, that picture of everything we're gonna be talking about here. Um, how do I kind of draw on here? Okay, I hope it captures this. So we have our placenta here. That's gonna be a big factor in here. Next is gonna be ductus arteriosus. In between that's gonna be the pulmonary artery and down is going to be the ductus venosus. Okay, we can always come back to this. Um, there's a really good Kahoot video out there that I personally learned all this from um, when it came to this stuff and it helps significantly, okay? Bring it all together. Uh, the placenta will be removed from the fetal circulation. This is going to be through what's called the closure of the ductus venosus. The umbilical cord is cut and clamped. Orange jelly contracts around the vessels. Two arteries, one vein, of course. Once the temperature falls, the act, this is all about resistance, okay? So once the temperature falls, the resistance within this area is going to go up. Therefore, no blood will be coming this way. Everything is all leaving and saying, I'm getting out of here. Um, so the blood's not actually able to come back because of the high resistance. This is that same high resistance that actually was um, within these areas here. This is why back in the day, before, there was so much resistance up here that there's actually no blood. Uh, it was all bypassing the lungs and stuff like that, okay? Alrighty, let's go and erase that right there. I forgot how to do it. Eraser. I don't want to lead you guys astray. Okay. Okay. Um, blood in the umbilical vein and Dr. Venom starts clotting off and blood flow decreases. Okay, lungs take in air. With that first breath, it pushes the fluid right out of the lungs, increasing the oxygen levels, changes the, the pressure in the pulmonary vessels on each side of the heart. Air pushes fluid out of the alveoli, fluids going to those capillaries. Uh, the oxygen levels are going to rise in the alveoli. That will signal the arterial to dilate. Arterial is going to dilate. The lungs will flow from a high to a low resistance, which is what I said, um, which is why they can finally go down in there. The oxygen and blood can enter the heart since the resistance in the lungs isn't so high. The low pressure. Low pressure causes the formula valley to close off. First few minutes of life. Oxygen blood gets into the aorta. The closure of the ductus aorus. Okay. Um, the initial reason blood was going from the pulmonary artery to the aorta was the pressure in the pulmonary artery was so high. Remember, if the pressure's high, nothing's going to it. Mm -mm. Okay. Um, the muscles in the ductus arteriosus um, constrict in the first few hours of life. They're going to sense an increased oxygen in the blood. Prostaglandins that are produced by the placenta were no longer, are no longer present due to the removal of the placenta. So the ductus arteriosus closes. Okay. Um, Postaglandins are produced by the placenta and keep the ductus arteriosus open. Once the placenta is being cut off, prostaglandin levels decrease and signal the body to close that ductus arteriosus. All right, so kind of key points to stay away from this. Mom should not take NSAIDs during pregnancy. This is really disgusting. Sorry, guys. But no, no, no. Um, they're prostaglandin inhibitors, which can affect the prostaglandins that maintain fetal circulation, okay? Um, NSAIDs would close the ductus arteriosus. Therefore, NSAIDs can be given after birth to help close the ductus arteriosus. A ductus arteriosus on a baby that has been born is bad. All righty. <clears throat> so pretty much, if there is like a... If they're having a kind of a cardiac defect where the only reason they're living is because the DA is open, we will give them prostaglandins, okay? But with 
this stage of life, the prostaglandins in a normal heart, we don't really want them to be going. Um, we don't want them to be going. Um, I'm sorry, I'm confused right now. So I'll move on, I'll move on. All right, liver function. Okay, so the big kind of points from this is we're gonna have two types of um, bilirubin. We have unconjugated and conjugated. Okay, bilirubin is the product of the breakdown of red blood cells, of course. Um, but with the conjugated, this is the, um, the good stuff. This is the excretable, so it's able to be released, that direct bilirubin. With the unconjugated, we have a toxic, and this is indirect, okay? Um, the total, of, of course, is just both. But the fetal liver is not ready to conjugate bilirubin well, so that can lead to, to, to uh, jaundice. High, and high levels of that will actually cause what's called crinicterus, which is um, pretty much they're going to have lots of brain damage. Okay. And um, that's why it's really important to kind of take those prevented uh, actions. All right. Next, we have two levels of jaundice. We have the physiologic jaundice, the, the good one, and we have the pathologic jaundice, the not so good one. Okay, so this one's normal. This would be three to four days after birth. So if it's something immediately, uh, the first 24 hours, it'd be not, not so good. Okay, so that pathologic jaundice is um, usually caused by a blood type um, incompatibility. Um, it's a seen at birth or it's in the first 24 hours of life. So pretty much there's those uh, blue room levels. If there's a faster than it, five, Uh, five milligrams per uh, deciliter and 24 hours longer than one week. The direct bilirubin is uh, more than two milligrams uh, per DL. And the healthy infants, that level would be more than 15. Um, but those levels are usually lower in preterm. Too much bilirubin can cause brain damage, of course. Um, risk factors for jaundice would be a um, cephalohematoma, which is just lots of blood being in the head. Um, delayed cord clamping if they're breastfed, if they have, if they're really small, so if they're like small for gestational age, if they're preemies, or if they're just sick. All right, thermoregulation. So we're talking about temperature here. Why is this so, so important in babies? Um, why do they always have problems with uh, regulating the temperature? Because they have decreased subcutaneous fat, their skin is very thin. Um, which means that their blood vessels are really close to the uh, superficial layer of their skin. The temperatures are going to go down at birth, of course. They're getting out into the air. It's much uh, colder outside. <clears throat> and of course, if they're having any evaporation of fluid off of their skin. Uh, if the baby gets cold, there's an increased metabolic rate, which will kick in and try to maintain the temperature, kind of as a compensation effort, okay? Okay. Um, but also, I mean, very easy, babies do not shiver. They don't have the ability to. So if they're just stuck out in the open, um, they're going to be getting cold really fast. That's why we're making sure that they have their those hats on, making sure that they're swaddled, things like that. Um, they use brown adipose tissue to create heat. Um, but if they have limited stores of brown fat, they need some oxygen to, to metabolize it. So Usually if they have problems with the respiratory system, they're gonna have problems with temperature control as well. Oops, oops. All right, uh, newborn hypothermia. If they're essentially very cold, um, they're gonna have a higher ratio of body surface area to body volume. Very simple to think of. So they're having lots of opportunities to lose heat. Their heads are really big, think about it. They're growing cephalocaudal. Um, so they can lose a lot of heat through their head. That's why you wanna have the caps on um, and oof, yeah. They're very small musculature. They can't shiver, they can't compensate. They're poorly insulated and they can't move. They, they can't move, they're stuck there. So it's not like, you know, if you're a little kid and it's cold, you can just put a blanket on you. Next slide, we have this really important stuff here. <clears throat> How do infants lose heat? You will be tested on this 100%. 
Um, I'm gonna draw a star. Uh, okay, so we have four different types of ways, and these picture really just brings it all together. Love this picture. Please put this picture in your notes. It'll help a lot. Um, convection. Uh, that's one that kind of the, the air passing over the baby. So heat is lost to air or fluid around the infant that is cooler than the temperature. So kind of like a draft. Okay, so air from an open door in the delivery room. Um, a fan blowing. Okay. <clears throat> Next is going to be to the left. This is radiation. Um, heat is lost to a solid object near the infant that are cooler than the infant's temperature, but are not touching. That's the big key difference with radiation. This could be a cold ceiling above them, a cold wall. Um, really, even um, not, not a table, not a table. I wouldn't be that. OK, next is going to be evaporation, of course, the easiest one. Um, heat is lost when the water evaporates. Uh, that water is on the, on the infant's skin surface. Um, so it's really important that if you do not dry them, they're going to be losing heat fast. Okay, this is the most common loss of heat because this occurs immediately after birth when they're moving from the wet to the air environment. And of course, I think this is the easiest one as well, conduction. <coughs> heat loss to a cold surface um, in which they actually come into contact, okay? Think about if you wanna really kind of use something to memorize this, I always thought of uh, conduction of electricity. It's kind of touching it, okay? Think of an x-ray plate, uh, a cold mattress, a cold stethoscope, cold hands. So you really make sure you're warm when you're touching these babies. All right, okay. What can we do? We're gonna be using radiant warmers. Um, for initial care, the temperature is controlled by a, a probe on the baby skin that comes into contact with the warmer, okay? Um, <clears throat> make sure the side rails are up because that will cause you to lose heat through that convection of the air moving across okay uh, skin temp probes do not lay the infant on its skin probe do not place over any bony prominences um, or areas of brown fat deposits any poorly vascular areas or any excoriated areas we want to keep the probe exposed to the heat source and securely attached we're going to be putting blankets and caps on make them real cute skin to skin of course that's the Number one thing we can kind of do, you know, let them warm up with their mom's heat. Um, keeping them dry, of course, we want to prevent that evaporation. We're going to be kind of really checking their temperature every single hour. So if you haven't been in the, the to the um, clinicals yet, a lot of times you're doing vitals. And it's really important that you take their uh, vital signs of these infants all the time because you want to make sure they're doing okay. Reduce exposure to drafts. So don't go in and slam the door right open. Bring that cold air in there. You like that. All right, next slide. Glucose metabolism. Um, this is about just really burning energy. So, okay, let's keep moving. <clears throat> the babies will experience an energy crunch at the time of birth um, with the cutting of the, of the umbilical cord and the removal of the glucose supply. So think about it. They're really um, being drowned in sugar and then they're going to be taking out that supply. Okay, so the fuel sources are not consumed at a, or, I mean, they're, they're consumed at a faster rate because of the work they are of breathing, the loss of heat, you know, they're out in a colder environment. Um, also, they're having to activate their muscles as well. So what? They have a high risk of hypoglycemia, which can cause brain damage. Hypoglycemia is the main concern, but hyperglycemia can also occur. Um, if you have a hyperglycemic baby, that'd be a very sick baby. Okay. Prevention and intervention. Um, who is most at risk? This would be our, um, our big babies. Cause I mean, they're hyped up on sugar. Um, our diabetic babies, our gestational diabetes babies, of course, just large for gestational age babies as well. Babies that are having trouble with breastfeeding maybe a small for gestational age baby. Um, they don't have that extra storage if their blood glucose levels drop. <clears throat> um, if they're having a low glucose level, kind of a sign for this is gonna be, they're gonna be jittery, they're gonna be um, cyanotic, 
going to be blue. They might be um, apneic, so they're going to be reducing their breathing. Um, lower um, temperature as well. They're going to have a poor body tone. They're not going to feed well. They're going to be very still, very lethargic. And of course, they could have seizures as well. <clears throat> the normal glucose level of a baby is going to be 50 to 150. And this is going to be done a heel stick on the side of their foot because uh, you're not wanting to getting, be getting any nerve damage. Okay. Kind of the interventions for this would be usually food. Um, if they need any IV fluids with that as well. Um, but uh, yes. All right. Going into coagulation abilities, this is why we're giving that vitamin K. Um, <clears throat> there was another word for this. <clears throat> Um, I'm not going to tell you what it is right now, but you said it earlier and I talked to the name. Okay. Uh, if you need a reminder. All right. So this is going to be, um, we're giving that vitamin K in less decline by the parents, but we're going to be lots, lots of teaching because we really want them to get that. Okay. Um, professor Harold might give you lots of teaching experiences about babies that didn't get it. And then that end up, uh, the parents ended up regretting it. They're at a huge risk for bleeding and coag problems if they don't get it. Um, they have to be really cautious about finger sticks, newborn screens, things like that. And if they're a boy, if they don't have the vitamin K, they cannot get circumcised. <clears throat> the oral isn't as effective and it needs to be taken for a longer period of time than just the standard IM injection. Our immune function, we're going to be talking about the different um, types of immunity. So we have like passive, things like that. Okay, let's go. <clears throat> right, immunity in newborns. Um, in the newborn, their immune system isn't as uh, developed. Therefore, they have a high risk of infection. However, they are different in which ways they can actually build their immune system. We have IgG, which is actually passive acquired immunity. This is given from our mom through the placenta. And this is usually acquired in the third trimester. Um, so if they don't finish that trimester, the premiums aren't going to be getting this protection. And then uh, Okay, uh, varies from weeks to months depending on the pathogen. IgM is given as an infection in utero, utero that the baby had uh, received. Um, the way to kind of check this is they're going to have positive antibodies. IgA is via colostrum. Um, this is kind of given to help them protect the respiratory um, system, also the GI tract and their eyes. So this is uh, colostrum is actually received from the breast milk. It's full of lots of nutrients. Um, also, immunoglobulins as well. That's kind of why I another kind of tip of why breastfeeding is a lot better. Infection in newborns. <clears throat> this is very subtle because uh, the system is developing over the first year of life. Uh, sleepy increased or decreased in temperature. They're not eating well. As they're having a cold or a decreased white blood cell count. Uh, abdominal distension, decreased urine output. Um, check the differentials. If our mom has a symptom of, of an infection, you need to kind of check the baby for those signs as well. And for our preemies, you're going to be starting treatment immediately. Uh, another thing to mention with pediatrics, if they, if you have a, um, not a newborn, but if you have a baby that's less than three months uh, old, if they have a fever, if you're going to be doing a septic um, work up because babies are not meant to be having fevers that are um, less than three months old. <clears throat> and then I would just read that as well. <clears throat> you might be asking why it's a decreased white blood cell count. Um, that's because their circulatory system is actually slower to respond. It's immature. Um, all of these cells are being sent out to fight the infection. Therefore, they're going down. All right, immunizations, vaccines. Important for a mom to uh, be up to date on the shots. Um, Tdap uh, <clears throat> protects the baby from neonatal uh, tetanus, uh, umbilicus site entry of bacteria. Uh, at birth, you can get the Hep V first round. Uh, this protects from maternal hepatitis B, um, which can really prevent some very strong illnesses. 
next set at two months as early as six weeks example for the baby could have um you know sickle cell vaccine for early protection the cdc does have a kind of a thing on there um that shows them up to date on records um no live uh virus vac vaccines until the first year old um to get that best response I would say for this, you really don't need to memorize that much, but you need to know which vaccines are alive and which ones are um, not alive. Uh, big note, MMR, check on that one. If there are specific considerations for any of these vaccines, please know those. Um, but as for the schedule, you don't, you don't need to know that, okay? This slide is, this is taken from um, Professor Harrell's PowerPoint, for those that need to get a better picture of it. Um, know the torch infections um, and their mode of transmission, okay? Know the big infections that we were treating mom and our baby uh, with their specific needs, uh, meds. <clears throat> uh, we've already kind of talked about this a little bit, but uh, when it comes to breastfeeding, bottle bed babies are at an increased risk for infections because they're not getting those antibodies via that colostrum, okay? If mom gets sick while nursing, you want to keep nursing. We want to help them build those antibodies and give them to the baby to protect the baby as well from anything from the future. Um, can moms use uh, drugs while breastfeeding? Nope. Can moms with poor milk supply? Uh, moms with poor, poor milk supply would be a high blood pressure mother or a diabetic mother as well. Contraindications where this are would be an active untreated uh, tuberculosis, galactosemia, of course, drug or alcohol use, NOVA and also cancer drugs as well. All right, just a general assessment. <coughs> know the DeWitt's and the Ballard assessment scales, really more for clinical. Um, observe the physical and the neuromuscular parameters. parameters. Um, they're gonna have a standardized test chart with the weight, the length, the head, circumference as well. Uh, this is really important whenever it comes to understanding if you have an LGA baby, uh, an AGA baby, or an SGA baby. That's just large, uh, <coughs> small. I kind of forget what A was. Okay, but really they're going to have a chart coming up. Um, and kind of knowing that uh, AGA is going to be 10 through 90. If it's less than the 10% curve, it's going to be a small baby. And if it's the large, it's going to be more than 90% on the 90% uh, marker on the curve. This is kind of that Ballard score here. <clears throat> it's kind of cool because I, I really believe that this kind of changes a little bit. Um, I saw this in clinical and it wasn't the same the one that we had in our textbook. So it's kind of changes a little bit. Um, all right, so with Ballard, you're looking at the postured, um, <clears throat> the square window, the wrist, the arm recoil, their popliteal angle, um, the heel to ear, their skin, the having lanugo, maybe even their genitals as well. They're more flexible, no more preterm. Uh, once complete, add up the numbers and look at the table to translate that score. Uh, an LGA baby would be at risk for unstable glucose levels, and an SGA baby would be higher risk for temperature instability. <clears throat> also, maybe an uh, instable glucose level. And then, of course, they have a higher chance of like jaundice with their hyper uh, bilirubin levels. This is kind of that growth chart here. So, of course, 90% was here. We did have the less than 10%, which would make them SGA. Well, it's right here. <laughs> and of course, I need that as well. We had kind of go into some more mortality levels. This picture here is actually all babies that are the same age. They're just one's large, one's appropriate for that gestational age, and one is very small. So if you go to a, if you were to see this baby and think that, oh, that's just preemie, that is not the case with this baby. All right, feeding and weight. Um, <clears throat> This is very important here. I'm going to underline it for you. 10% of the loss of weight from the birth in the first week of life 
but it should return by the second week. Okay. <clears throat> With feeding, you want to start breastfeeding as early as possible because feeding, um, breastfeeding actually releases oxytocin from the mother, stimulating some uterine contractions, which would kind of help with um, the involution of the uterus as well. Standard formula in breast milk, 20 calories per ounces, breastfeeding on demand. Uh, formula feeding for the first few hours of life, more than no, uh, no more than one ounce at first, but after the first few days, uh, two to three ounces every four, three or four hours is okay. You don't want to force feed. It's usually um, on demand, okay? So you can like check that, like the rooting reflex that would kind of help as well. Um, breast milk that is actually freshly expressed and not refrigerated is good for a few hours. Breast milk is good for a lot longer than formula because it is bacterial static, meaning that it actually has good bacteria in it and it's keeping the bad bacteria away. All right, hearing screen, state mandated why. Uh, early intervention is key. Um, a lot of times, you know, <clears throat> maybe for our um, non-traditional students, you know, they might have, have a friend that's like, hey, um, I have a friend that they actually didn't do the hearing screen for them and they have some hearing problems. Um, so this is kind of cool because I've seen this actually. They'll put like a cool headset on, on the baby um, not really a headset, but it's kind of, uh, they're measuring the brain waves. So they're putting the scan on the head um, and they're really putting some sounds on and they're really looking at the brain waves to see if they're kind of hearing it rather in layman's terms, okay? Um, but it's, you have to make sure they're not crying, okay? You wanna make sure they're very calm during this because that could alter your results. Um, when I saw it, I, I saw a baby almost fail this, the test um, because they actually started crying. So they pretty much had to do it again in terms of they pass the thing as well. They get a cool certificate, so it's kind of cute. Um, this helps them catch and treat anything early. Uh, this could maybe help uh, any developmental delays, uh, improving their quality of life, uh, even if they have any complications as well. This is all about prevention. Um, babies don't talk until they're about two years old, so if you can catch and fix the problem early, it won't impair their speech ability. All right, newborn screen labs. Um, they're do, they're do, they've getting a newborn screen done before discharge um, on every unit, regardless of the age or feeding status. Um, this is actually a mandated thing, so everyone's gonna get it. The blood sample is sent out to the state to check for metabolic diseases. This screens for 28 gen genetic disorders and congenital. I'm sorry, I can't say that. Hearing loss. We have PKU. We have hypersemia. We have maple syrup, urine disease, cystic fibrosis, a gene effect on the seventh chromosome. A lot of times, uh, cystic fibrosis babies will have what's called a meconium ileus. So that's kind of thing then as well. Um, hemoglobin uh, opathies, so six cell, sickle cell, um, they just really observe and brought these things. Maybe a hypothyroid as well. Um, the longer the baby is in a hypothyroidic state, the more brain, brain damage can occur. And it's kind of what this is. It's not really too important. Just know what is on the newborn screening test. I guarantee you that could be a SATA um, if she happens to give you one. <clears throat> Congenital heart defects. This one's really cool because this is actually an entire uh, week. Not a week, but it's an, it's an entire unit in peds. So... Um, this is like the baby stuff compared to what happens later, but it's cool because this is actually kind of a test that they do. <clears throat> we'll call them CHDs. CHDs can be caught, taught early, uh, caught early and if the mom has good prenatal care. So um, this is kind of done uh, via ultrasound if they're getting that. Um, you have to catch the congenital heart defects before they go home. Some CHDs are ductal dependent. Um, so which ductal dependent means that if that ductus closes, the ductus arteriosus closes, that baby will not survive. <clears throat> it says right here. So um, pretty much what they would do is if, if it's a ductal dependent thing, they'll actually give them prostaglandins because like we said earlier, prostaglandins will inhibit the closure of um, those valves. So it's keeping them alive. Okay, so there's, there's a test video for this. We'll do a pulse ox on their right hand. Um, if it's less than 90%, they're gonna uh, kind of grab your cardiac doctor. If it's 
between 90 and 95% this you're actually going to compare this to the rest of the body. Um, if let's say you put it on the left leg, um, if it's greater than a 3% difference, we're going to repeat in an hour. Um, <clears throat> we're going to do that three times before we would do a cardiac consult. If it's less than a 3% difference, you're, you're chilling. Um, so that was on the preductal, which is called the right hand. It will be the right hand. It will not be the left hand. Okay. Um, but the postductal will be, um, you're looking for that 3% difference. If it's positive, you're a potential for a, a CHD. If it's negative, uh, nada, no problem, no possible CHD is occurring here. Make sure you keep moving the pulse ox probes to prevent burns on the baby. Um, I've seen some pictures where they keep the pulse ox in there way too long and it just looks like it's hurting them. I mean, it is, but you know, a lot of burns could be occurring. Now we have a really cool picture here, bringing all of it together. <clears throat> um, so we're doing a screen here. Um, we have a 90% in the right hand or foot. Uh, if they have less than that, boom, positive screen. <clears throat> okay, if it is between 90 and 90% in the right hand and foot, or less than 3% difference between the right and hand and the foot, you're going to repeat it in an hour. And of course, you're going to only do that three times. Okay. Um, if they have more than a 95% oxygen level in the right hand or the foot um, and less than 3% difference between the right hand and the right foot, then it is a negative screen. You are live in. I, I have prophylaxis, erythromycin ointment um, used to prevent uh, things like gonorrhea and chlamydia. This is, oh, I got correct then. Um, and putting at the inner canthus kind of like a strand of ointment, and then you're going to massage it gently. This can be delayed uh, up to an hour, but a, lo a lot of times they'll actually kind of put this on while they're actually kind of uh, shortly after measuring the baby uh, in the nursery and um, getting a correct weight as well. <clears throat> this might cause some chem uh, chemical uh, conjunctivitis, maybe some edema, inflammation, discharge, um, inability to focus, maybe some dis discomfort as well but it should go away between uh, in two days. All right, newborn care. All right, pseudo uh, menstruation is normal in female. So if they have some like, pink discharge, that's, that's okay. Okay, you're gonna make sure they're wiping front to back uh, with diapering, warm water wipes, uh, no powder, because that could be a risk for aspiration. And we want, we want to make sure we're cleaning the umbilical cord with alcohol wipe. Uh, you may uh, see this not, not done. Warm water on the face, no soap, no lotion, uh, baby shampoo for hair. Circumcision, cleaning, cleaning it with soapy water. Um, that's what that, you're not going to, you're not going to pour peroxide on them. Um, soapy water. Okay. Um, monitoring it hourly for four hours, looking for bleeding. Um, if they're having any, uh, disabilities, avoiding, that'd be an issue. Um, output, <clears throat> sorry, output, uh, you're counting the wet and dirty diapers. So it's really cool if you go to the newborn as a nurse, um, they're going to say like, um, I don't know, Blake, 630s. Uh, um, that's kind of what they're going to say, wet, dirty, that's what's going on. <clears throat> <All right. clears throat> kind of hard to see here, but uh, braces are put on the child and parent. That includes the baby's name, sex, date, time of birth, identification, numbers. This is put. This is matched with the parent and the child. So, um, you know, I know you, you may have seen friends and they got the babies mixed up. Well, that would never happen in real life anymore because they're going to be having a bracelet put on as soon as they're born. Okay. Um, formula feeding. Teach them techniques if the water supply is questionable. Um, do not heat the bottle in the microwave. Don't ever do that. Um, that's because the bottle in a microwave were actually kind of distant, different areas of that liquid will be hot. Some will actually be a little colder. So if you put your finger in there and you think it's cold, maybe the bottom of it's really hot and you will burn that baby. Formula only in a sufficient diet for the first six months. Uh, with breastfeeding, noticing if they're unable to latch. Um, I believe Professor Harrell would have sent you a video teaching these guys some cool stuff about latching. So it's kind of cool. Um, teaching mom how to pump breast 
store breast milk. <clears throat> breast milk only is sufficient for the first, um, is, is only sufficient the first six months. With in regards to bathing, you want to bathe the newborn in a warm room before feeding. Use a mild soap, not on the face though, and then clean, clean their eyes from the inner canthus outward. And please make sure to dry your baby. It will be losing that temperature and could get sick. Right, in regards to clothes, um, instruct your mother that that head must be covered. Remember, they can lose a lot of heat from their head. Thick layers for cold weather. Um, this really goes into um, our heart goes out to those babies that could have gotten really sick in February with the freeze. Um, I know personally, I was in clinical a week before, and I I just was worrying about those babies that were born when I was there and knowing that they're probably at home, um, they could be really cold. So hopefully they got some safety, things like that. Okay, cord care, uh, umbilical clamp can be removed after 24 hours if the cord is dried. Uh, you're gonna be cleaning using soap and water, not alcohol. Fold the, uh, the diaper below the cord, okay? So the newborn is washed via a sponge bath until the cord falls off within two weeks. Home care should emphasize on keeping the cord stump clean and dry. The area should ex be exposed to air. That's already going to dry it feature with it or covered with a loosely clean clothes. <clears throat> for an uncircumcised newborn, inform mom that the foreskin glands are two similar layers of cells that separate from each other and that the separation process is normally completed by three years of age. Okay. Really important. Instruct the mom to not pull back on the foreskin, but allow it to do the separation. Um, naturally okay clean it with soapy water again soap water things like that <clears throat> in regards to car seats guys um nowadays they must have it in order to be discharged so it's kind of cute you know when they leave they're going to be uh, a lot of times they'll walk into the car and they're help them install it teaching them things like that making sure that that car seat is federally approved i know some hospitals here in corpus their school does that they do car seat drives they will give out Fairly proof car seats. Uh, and of course, understanding that car seats can expire. Well, we're right, I know. Um, safest spot in the middle facing the back. When to call the doctor if they're having a temperature above 104. Okay, because remember, temperature is <clears throat> a fever is not normal. Okay. Continuous rise in temperature, or maybe more than one forceful episode of vomiting in six hours. If they refuse two feedings in a row, or if they're just lethargic, whether or not being aroused, um, cyanosis with or without feeding. <clears throat> Maybe they're um, not breathing for more than 20 seconds. Um, if they're having those high pitch cries, you know what those cries sound like, the ones that are indicative of a sick baby. Maybe if they're not having wet diapers for more than a day, or if they have any eye drainage as well. All righty, um, next we're going into our <clears throat> newborn physical assessment. This is the same video, but different PowerPoint, okay? So if you, if you need to take a break, pause it right here, write down the number we're at uh, for the video, and it'll help you out. All right, <clears throat> okay, so uh, vital signs. Um, a lot of this, I'm not gonna read it because it'd be just a lot to read, but, <clears throat> Okay, temperature, of course, 97.5 to 99. Respirations, recognize that our resp the respirations for these babies are gonna be a lot higher than us, um, 30 to 60. If it's more than 80, that'd be tachypnea. Um, they don't feed because of the risk of aspiration, okay? Heart rate is not um, 60 to 100 for these babies. It's gonna be um, 120 to 160. And if they're crying, it's gonna be up to 180. Um, during their sleeping phases, it could be, you know, 100 to 110. Listen when the infant is quiet. If they're having a slur or a slush sound, that's going to be evaluation. The pulses will be on the brachial, normal pulses and the pedal pulses. And the weight, it's going to be um, 2,500 to uh, 4,000 grams. Five pounds, eight ounces, uh, normally to, you know, eight pounds, 13 ounces as well. Um, 18 to 22 inches is going to be that. Um, and just recognize that 2.54 would be your number if you're going to multiply to get the other number. All right, meconium, um, 24 to 48 hours. 
measurements, uh, weight of five to 10% loss in, in the first three to four days is normal because it will come back to it within the first couple of weeks. Alrighty. Um, of course, head, head circumference, the bigger the chest in the first few months. Um, so they're not gonna be the equal number, okay? Uh, one thing that's not on here, I guess you, you should mention, uh, babies are at a pretty high risk for dehydration. That's because they're actually not able to concentrate their urine as much as we are. Just recognize that. All right, head. We actually have some pretty cool pictures here. Um, <clears throat> always in a circumference. Assess the fontanelles. These are those fontanelles hill here on this side of the picture. Um, molding. Molding is a, a asymmetry caused by overriding of the cranial bones during labor and delivery process. And this usually resolves in the first two, three days. This would be a picture of molding over here, okay? Um, fontanelles, wait, that's right here. Um, anterior is gonna be diamond shaped, posterior is gonna be that triangular shape, okay? Um, so we have the uh, frontal and the occipital here. Cephalohematoma, very important here. Um, <clears throat> this is the collection of blood from a ruptured capillary that may develop after birth. Um, Cephalohematoma does not cross suture lines, okay? Um, very important, please write that down right now, highlight it, um, okay? Um, hematoma, that's in the word, so it's obviously, it helps you understand that this is involving blood. So um, if they're having this bleeding occurring, they're at a high risk of hyperbilirubinemia. So they're having an increased risk for jaundice, essentially. Next, we have the caput, that word, succadium, something like that. Um, this is just edema of the tissues, but this is, this, uh, does cross suture lines. Okay. Um, caused maybe by a vacuum delivery. Okay. Um, you will be tested on this guaranteed. So understand these two, write it out, memorize it. I would say they kind of help you memorize this. Think of it as this is one long word. It is not crossing anywhere at all. This is two words here. Well, I drew one line on accident. This is two words. So <laughs> they're crossing to get to the next word. Ah, okay. Okay, uh, with the skin, skin components here, um, next we have jaundice. This is first note on the face, yellowing, blanching over the cartilage nose, the sclera. That will turn yellow as well then it will spread all over the body. Understanding cold dress could be a very important issue as well. Um, monitoring the eye, nose, stooling. <clears throat> Teaching the parents who are going through um, maybe phototherapy, how to maintain their bonding, uh, how to breastfeed, things like that. Uh, in regards to turgor, you're assessing this at the abdomen or the thigh, and it should be very elastic. Okay, skin variations. Okay, this first one here we've mentioned maybe a hundred times. Acrocyanosis, this is where their hands and feet are blue, but the rest of the body is that pink color. This is normal. This would often give them an APGAR score of nine. This is normal for the first two to six hours after birth. <clears throat> uh, modeling is a lacy pattern of, of uh, dilated blood vessels under the skin. This may come and go. This is normal. That's kind of like a little rash. Okay. Uh, Erythema toxicum, this is those small lesions that have that poppy look to them. This looks similar to kind of acne or ant bites. And this, this should resolve within the first two days. Um, it's usually known by a newborn rash. And I, I, this was actually in your textbook. There's a really cool picture of this. All right, milia is that very small white spots. <clears throat> milia is the cool stuff that it looks like this. A lot of stuff like that. It's gonna be just very dots. Um, and this is on the face and it's going to go away normally. Um, vernix, uh, Cassiosa, just really vernix will help you remember that what that is. It has that cheese-like substance and do not rub it off. This is actually good for the baby. Um, if they have any forceps or vacuum marks, uh, make sure you evaluate that for other problems. Maybe, uh, if they're having paralysis or if there's any, like, I guess, injuries that they could have gotten from using those uh, things. Uh, stork bites, we, um, those are those red spots on the eyelids, nose, or neck. 
<coughs> they usually fade by two years of age. Um, okay, next is Mongolian spots. This is that bluish pigmentation on the on the back area uh, or their butt. And make sure it's very important that you document this because you don't want to kind of uh, mistake them for a bruise later in life, okay? Um, next is going to be the port wine stain. This is a capillary angioma under the skin. This is frequently on the face, usually does not change. <clears throat> then we have a uh, navus uh, vasculosis, a raised capillary hand hemangioma. Uh, if this can grow quickly, but it also usually does resolve spontaneously as well. Big ones of this. Um, I'd say all but the last two, know those back and forward. Okay. All right, face, um, eyes um, open, are they closed? Um, hemorrhages in the eyes, uh, scleroid or tears, the red reflex. The light reflecting off the retina, no, uh, that would equal no cataracts, okay? Um, the nose near should be patent, the mouth, you make sure you observe that sucking reflex. So a lot of times you can actually put your finger in there um, and test the sucking reflex. You can look at the teeth, their palate, all together, okay. And the Epstein's pearls are going to usually going to be in the very back. Um, it's kind of that white little dots, white pearls in a way. <clears throat> uh, thrush is going to be also the white patches on the mucous membranes. Um, if it's candida, this is indicative of a yeast infection from the mom's uh, vaginal canal during birth. So you're going to be treating the mom and the baby. Um, you can't treat with antibiotics, but antifungals or natural remedies are very um, naturally used. Okay, thrush is very painful for the mom, so you make sure you treat the mom and the baby. Um, milk will wipe off, but thrush will not come off. So that's kind of that's kind of how you observe the difference between those two. Of course, next we have our frenulums, um, the tongue. This is all about the tongue here. Um, <clears throat> tongue tied. If it, if you pull in the tongue to give it a heart shape, refer to an eval and monitor for feeding. Don't clip it unless it's uh, symptomatic. If they're having trouble breastfeeding, but the mom has lacerations on her nipples, or if there's any impaired speech. These are the list of our bodies here. All right, in, in, in regards to the ears, um, we're looking at the, the pinna, checking for some skin tags, uh, making sure it's patent as well. Uh, these do develop at the same time as major organs. So if they're having any ear issues, usually they're going to be having kidney problems as well. Okay. Uh, tail mature, uh, maturity level. The more mature, the more cartilage you'll have on the ear. So if they're a term baby, whenever you pull that ear back, um, it's going to be going back immediately. Whenever you do it on a preemie baby, it'll stay coiled over. Kind of like whenever you do it to your dog. All right, neck. Um, are they having any masses? Are they having any web webbing? Uh, range of motion. Um, are the clavicles intact or without crepitus? What well, crepitus in indicate? Um, maybe, maybe an injury uh, through the birthing process. All right, chest. Is it symmet symmetric? Uh, look, make sure the nipples, um, looking at their breast engorgement, uh, are they having any retractions? The cry should be very um, strong. It should also be a medium pitch. If it's a high pitch shrill, you might have um, some issues. So that'd be for an evaluation right there. All right, breathing, counting by observing the abdomen. You can listen, look, palpate. Um, the reason I say this is because if you try to take a respiratory rate on a baby, you're going to struggle counting. Tell you what. Um, Okay, so abnormal would be nasal flaring, retractions, whether you see their whole chest essentially helping them breathe, um, and then grunting as well. Abdomen, visualized should be no distension, a uh, few if any vessels. Auscultating their bowel sounds, palpating, this should be soft, non tender, with no masses. Of course, with the umbilical cord, Making sure it's got two arteries, one, two arteries, one vein, um, no bleeding or discharge occurred from that site. All right, now with our genitals, um, with our girls, making sure 
I'm checking the size, um, making sure it's appropriate for gestational age, um, so make, uh, looking at the vernix as well. In regards to males, uh, checking the position of the urethral meatus. Um, that's more of a peds thing, so I would, maybe that's not that important. Uh, it's kind of like checking where your urethra is. Is it on the top side? Is it in the center? Or is it below the penis? Um, movement of the foreskin. Size and symmetry of the scrotum. Bilateral descent of the testes. Okay. Uh, in regards to circumcision, there's going to be three methods. We have a gomco, a mojin, and a plasti bill. <clears throat> plasti bill is going to be that clear one. And those other two... Um, I haven't really seen one, so I don't have any much to say about that. All right, extremities, observing the number of digits, um, making sure they're equal. The skin folds should be appropriate. No opening, opening or tufts of hair at the base of the spine. The spine should be straight. Herbs palsy, um, this would be damage to CNS and CN6, cranial nerve, uh, SN6. Paralysis of the upper arm, no movement of the moral reflex on that side. Really big one though here, we have a highlighted Ortolani maneuver. This tests for hip dysplasia, or if they have any, um, or I'll just say this right here. Um, the fingertip over the, you're gonna put the fingertip over the, over the greater torque render, you're gonna roll the leg up and feel and, and out. If you feel a clunk, or if it has moved, the clicks will be bad. Congenital hip dysplasia is more common in breach presentations uh, than that of a vertex, okay? The treatment of this is usually going to be a, a harness that they're going to wear um, 23 and a half hours a day until the hip is fixed. Club foot um, won't move to midline. Back, if they're having a C-shaped spine, um, are they flat and straight well prone, straight uh, lumbar lordosis, easily flexed and uh, intact when palpated, at least half of the back, uh, devoid of lunego. Um, full term infants and ventral suspension should hold head at 45 degree angle with the back straight. If the baby has sacral dimples, ensure that they are closed. Um, impl uh, open dimples are usually indicative of uh, a neural tube defect or uh, potential spinal, spinal bifida. And lastly, our anus, making sure that it's patent. Um, you, you, there's a lot of stuff that you'll learn about later and peds regarding the um, GI system because their anus was not patent. Making sure babies pee and poop before leaving the hospital. All righty, that's pretty much it. Um, if you haven't, please start the video over and make sure you sign in using the QR code and please reach out if you have anything. All righty. Bye, guys.